The Phantasmagorium Show presents Guns, Martinis, Gadgets, and Guns. The year was 1983, and the world learned what was better than 1007. Two 007s. The official James Bond film Octopussy, starring Roger Moore, would be released against Sean Connery returning as James Bond. We'll edit that out. And co-stars Kim Basinger, Max von Sydow, Rowan Atkinson, and Bernie Casey in a film that can best be described as, have you seen Thunderball? That. Of course, I would be <laughs> remiss if I did not say that we were discussing 1983's Never Say Never Again. My name is Scotty. My opposite number, Catherine, is here. And Steve is eliminating all free radicals. And you would be further remiss for not mentioning Klaus Maria Brandauer. Well, no, I know. But you know what? Because I even tripped over what I wrote myself, I was not going to attempt that name in the intro. <laughs> I just said it rolls right off the tongue. Well, no, but you're better at it than I am, is what I'm saying. Anywho, oh, I thought I just muted everything. Anyway, perfect. So, uh, Kat, how you doing? All right. Me too. Good talk. Uh, big news this week in terms of uh, James Bond. Actually, since we last broadcasted, not necessarily this week, but over the last couple of weeks. Uh, the yeah, first one. Quite a few, uh, in no particular order, we're going to start with a very odd one. Uh, mm, the worst one. Yes, it was this. It was announced that for the last four years, Barbara and Michael have been collaborating with Amazon Prime to basically do a James Bond themed version of the Amazing Race, where you have contestants running around the world solving puzzles, doing crazy stunts, and it's again they're going to be competing for a million dollar prize, and it's like. I get that they've had more time on their hands because, you know, MGM's bankruptcy things and the dragging their feet trying to get in all of the COVID delays. And it's like, of all the things they could be working on with Amazon and the anticipation of, I mean, I know that Amazon already had the films on Prime before there was any announcement of a deal, but they want to do a game show. It's like, okay, I mean, you're basically going to be piggybacking off that. I guess it's their way of starting to build the brand. And now that the deal has gone through. I guess it's more of a sure thing. They're going to start filming later this year, apparently. So, I don't know. It just seems kind of an odd first step of what are we going to do with our new partner, you know? Kat, have you ever seen Spaceballs? Yeah. Remember when the Schwartz, or no, Yogurt, is like, the big money's in moichandising, moichandising. I feel that this is a dilution of the brand that will infantilize something that I find to be an adult adventure series that is coupled with martinis, gadgets, and guns because girls was already taken. Like, yeah. I find this. I find this to be PG ish. Pardon me. It is. And so, I do, I don't like it at all. And I don't know why the, well, I do understand why perhaps again, they're expanding the franchise, but I wish they would put that money into something better. Like yeah. proper video games, proper like remastering a direct. Hey, if you have that much money well, to make a reality television show out of James Bond, give me a good James Bond game again. Well, they, they have been working on a new James Bond game for a while. It's coming. That is true. That is true. But I haven't seen anything except for a teaser trailer, which is no gameplay. Right. Well, it's still in development. That's why they haven't been ready to release it yet. I saw that thing like two years ago. Well, that was like a demo test that they were showing off to announce that they were doing it. So it's still going on. I'm just saying allocation of resources. And I find that this particular venture will dilute the James Bond brand. Yeah, which is interesting because Amazon already came out and said that they're not once the uh, that they're not gonna. I guess that leads into the second news, which you can move on to to make that point, which is I, the day I after. Have, I threw my phone. I don't have my little pad. Okay, so the the day after the previous episode that we did, it was announced that the FTC approved the Amazon deal. It's done. Yes. So they have MGM. Excellent. Uh. But and, there were uh, there were protests against that. Yeah, there were several Hollywood unions protesting it. They probably assumed it was going to get rejected. 
And they're saying it basically helps Amazon create a monopoly. I'm not really sure about that because all they're getting is 4,000 movies, 17,000 episodes of television, which, yeah, that's a lot. But th- a lot of this is also television from a long time ago. So don't you say many, nothing unkind many... about anything from a long time ago. Well, no, I mean, how often are people going to go back and rewatch series from decades ago on a regular basis to the point that it's going to significantly boost Prime's profitability? I don't know about that. So. And the IP, as we Do talked they have about, the man from and, Uncle? and as we talked about, the lead up into this whole uh, sale was, oh, the Bond franchise was always singled out. So yeah, there's IP potential for this, but as far as a monopoly, how it's going to cause them to raise their prices? I mean, yeah, MGM's got some nice properties, but I don't see how that's going to radically change it when you consider all of the properties that other streaming services have. You know, it's like I don't really see that, and so that was bringing me to my point that. I was surprised that once the deal went through, Amazon announced in their uh, uh, in their uh, like little press release or whatever that they're not going to rush Eon for Bond, even though they own half of it now. Mm-hmm. They're going to let them take their time and do whatever they usually do because they already mentioned last year that they were committed to keeping them theatrical releases per Eon's wishes. So they're not going to fight that and you know try and get a tug of war over that, which is good. Uh, and I know that, as people have said, Barbara's busy with producing Daniel Craig's play Macbeth, which I believe just opened on Broadway, and we'll who keep plays going through. I believe the the end of June. Do you know who plays Lady Macbeth? No. Um, okay. But uh, that's been going on, so they'll probably. And, and again, I already think they know who they want. It's already already been established that each of the Bond actors, with the exception of Sean Connery, obviously, because he was the first that they've been watching them for years and knew who they wanted. In some cases like Timothy Dalton, they asked him like three different times before he said yes in three different eras. Mm -hmm. So I I think they already know. So, so whatever, that's all great. I'm not sure what the legal implications will be of these unions since there were a lot of them, like the writers guild, actors, all this kind of stuff. So we'll see how that shakes out. Um, Hopefully if the deal, because I mean, it seems like inevitable that somebody is going to get MGM. The company can't last on its own. That's been established. So, I don't know what these unions hope to accomplish by this. Would they be happier if it went to a different streaming service or do they want it like all broken up and auctioned off to different houses? I'm not really sure. I would, I would say the latter is what I think would be the safer option as opposed to having it under one umbrella company with so many intellectual properties that MGM owns. James Bond is being elevated and it's the lightning rod of the conversation, but ultimately Don't you? Well, I don't know about ultimately, but when you think, when I think, I'm going to use my, my, my pronouns. um, I just think that there's so many characters under the sun that they could spin off into TV shows or web shorts, or they could do it. Like they could do anything. They could, they could clamp it. Like, and clamp from gremlins to clamp any character from the MGM catalog and then just do whatever they want with it, which is what they've been doing with everything. And that's something that is evident with all of the studios happening now. And so I can understand how workers unions can be like, no, we don't like the idea that if we work on a, I don't well, a James Bond movie that we're just all we're owned by that. Or I don't know how unions work. But I can understand the intellectual property being broken apart. I am fearful of, just as a single example, I don't want to go on a tangent, but I'm fearful of Disney owning aliens. Like, that that's weird. Aren't they already developing a series or something based around that? I can't wait not to watch it. Kind of like that. Uh, well, amazing race James Bond. So they're going to have people in parachutes that look like the Union Jack. I do not need to see that. Yeah. Sorry. So anyway, I can understand why those intellectual properties that you hold, like if you have a regular job with a production company that regularly works with a specific intellectual property, then You want to protect that. You're in a union already. So it makes sense to be like, no, I wouldn't like it if the one of the most powerful companies in the world owns everything 
for the second time. I can understand where they're coming from. Moving on. Unless you I have don't anything understand else. where they're I don't understand where they're coming from because okay nobody because there weren't why why didn't we see all these mountains of protests and loss and complaints when Disney bought Pixar, Marvel, Lucasfilm, Fox. Yeah, yeah, they're buying all this no, stuff. No, but but that's the everyone that you've said when they bought Pixar, pick Pixar, when they bought Pixar. They got it and they made good stuff when they made when they bought Marvel. A bedrock had already been established by other studios, so there was a bedrock. Then they got Star Wars and there was a bedrock, and they were like, We're gonna need a backhoe. And like, it just doesn't, it's we're not on an escalating scale. This is all, but, still, but they still didn't. But they still did not oppose it. No, no, no. But we we waited. Audiences waited to see. I'm not talking. I don't care about the audiences. I'm talking about all the unions that are filing the complaints. They did not file complaints when Disney acquired all of these companies under one corporate umbrella. So why are they upset that Amazon is buying what amounts to a lot of really old TV shows that aren't going to get reboots or revivals, most likely? And then uh, eventually 4,000 movies. It's like, I don't get what the argument is. It's like, we, so, because again, I think it has Disney, to do with let's production, pick, production company association. Yeah, so it's very weird. I don't think it's going to hold water. Hopefully not. The good news is that they're not going to have to have years of delays anymore over, uh, you know, finding distributors and stuff like that. That's all over with. That's true. Well, and also it'd be interesting to see the uh, level of involvement of uh, Babs and, uh, you know, Max von Sydow. Uh, next up in the news, hang on a second. We're dealing with a black screen, which means that she is on a top secrets factor investigation while I have bum, 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 bum. you know what I don't know why that was like both the that was like the Klingon theme from Star Trek the motion picture and the theme from Robocop uh, but also oh my stars there are so many good newses from the Oscars did you guys see the Oscars it was a great time Um, I saw Rami Malek introduce um, Billie Eilish. And who is the other? He says, let's just call it the No Time to Die Oscar winning song. Who's the other guy? Like, I want to say Willems. Uh, what was that? The per Billie Eilish and the other performer who performed at the 94th Academy Awards. Oh, with her the on best, the piano, you mean? At the best moment of the Academy Awards. But you mean Phineas O'Connell? Is that what you're talking about? Phineas O'Connell is who I am speaking of. Yes, absolutely. And so that was a great performance. Yeah. That was a I really, really like every every time I talk to somebody about that song, they always say that there is no crescendo. And quite frankly, that had a crescendo. There was a denouement apropos, but it was absolutely, there was a crescendo during that song. Yeah, the original version they put out two years ago is still the best one for me. Uh, but, because right. uh, that has the crescendo to it, but, and the uh, addendum on it. But yeah, so it won the Oscar, uh, set the record the first time three consecutive Vaughn films have won Oscars after an 18 film drought that had lasted between Thunderball and Skyfall. So that's yeah. kind of cool. Uh, did I not get sound and visual effects. Both went to Doom. Well, um, but that's not a bad thing to lose to, is it? I maybe depending. I wasn't that overly impressed with the movie. I didn't like Doom. I mean, I, from a technical standpoint, okay, everybody led me to believe things that didn't turn out to be true. Like the sound is the best sound you've ever heard. No, I saw it in IMAX. It wasn't. The visuals and the sound in IMAX didn't really seem to benefit it. It was just like. When I watched it on HBO Max, even it didn't seem that different. We even should watching start it. A, we should start a show about Dune. 
Uh, no. So uh, unless we're idea. unless we're talking about the books and stuff in the whole world, then yes. Well, that's very no, but the only the only thing that I and just in response to uh, Dune winning the Oscar, that's great and all and everything. You saw it. You have an opinion based on both. Clearly, you like one more than the other. I didn't even see Dune, dude. So typical, I know which one I like Scott more. Passing heart, typical Scott passing harsh judgment on everything that he has never seen or has any no. intention of seeing. I'm just saying that D Dune deserved the visual effects over. I didn't say it didn't. I, I didn't say I didn't say I would have given it to no time to die. I didn't say that. No. And what I'm saying is that I'm glad Dune won is what I'm saying. All right, whatever. I don't care. And also, Denis Villeneuve is Canadian, so blame Canada. Uh, but yes, that and that was... But I really enjoyed the fact that Rami Malek introduced, and it was like Academy Award winner Rami Malek presenting for... And did you... Now, I have to ask you this. My mom asked you to ask you this. <clears throat> What did you think of the tribute video? That's right. They did one of those. Um, yeah. I'm not crazy that they scored it to live and let die. I think I that was... song is a bit overblown. It's okay. Um, yeah. I think they could have picked a better song. Uh, I think Nobody Does It Better would have been a better song for that, considering you're celebrating 60th anniversary of a particular character in a franchise. Well, uh, kind of odd that they didn't have any of the Bond actors come out and present it or any Bond actresses or anything. It was just, oh, Tony Hawk, Kelly Slater, and um, Sean White. I'm like, okay, I get it. They're like the best in their extreme version of sports and Bond is extreme. So you're gonna, okay, I get that. But it was still a little odd. I noticed that George Lazenby is the only one they didn't verbally mention when they were introducing the piece. They couldn't was, pronounce the name. I have the same problem. Uh, okay. Um you know, a two minute thing. And that was a theme, running theme throughout the awards where they were showing these montages for films having anniversaries. It's like, okay. Uh, so it was fine. I didn't like, I didn't mind it. I thought it was fine, but I yeah. didn't see the, pre I didn't see the presenters, but I watched the, like the, the video for it. And the reason that my mom brought it up and she was like, there was no Lois Maxwell. There was no Bernard Lee. There was no Robert Brown. Where was Desmond Llewellyn? Like, well, that's he, the thing. It was a very James Bond character centric tribute. It didn't focus on all the other people for the most part. Yeah, but it, I think it was a tightly edited piece of tribute. Like, I don't think that it was wrong. Like, when my mom described it to me first, she was like, and there was no Pierce Brosnan. There was only one shot of Pierce Brosnan. And I watched it, and I started counting, and I lost count. And I was like, Mom, you're crazy. You just want more Pierce Brosnan in everything. <laughs> so anyway, I had to bring that up. Hi, Mom. So what was so, the question? Oh no! You said did she you, wanted you. Th th you said that she wanted to ask me a question. Yeah, did you like it? Oh yeah, I thought it was fine. She did not like it, so she wants to fight you now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, pick a different song, and if it was, I mean, I can see why they probably didn't have a lot of those characters in there because if it's only two minutes, they want to show Bond highlights across all the Bond actors. If it was longer, maybe they would have, but yeah, like I said, it was fine. See, and the thing is, is that I, what I would go would have gone with, and I think it would have been sort of thematically appropriate, is the opening to Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Like the... Ba -da 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 -da, ma -ma -ma. Yeah, that too. That I, been... I should say, as I forgot to mention, that uh, you know, Covey Broccoli did get an honorary Oscar back in the early 80s for um, the franchise. Was there any footage of uh, Cubby? Well, it was. There wasn't a montage. It was just he walked up and they announced him. He walked up on stage. He accepted the award. He gave a brief speech, and that was that. No, I know, but isn't it like when I watch the Oscars? Usually, I get to see the history of film, and that's part yeah. of the reason why I watch it. It's not a music video. It's more of a. It's more of a museum. It's a. It's a slow. Well, walk. they literally did that. But did they show? Did they show the actual thing from him getting his Oscar? No, I, I meant that when you say the history of film, they literally went to the brand new. They filmed a pre-recorded segment at the 
the new Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences History Museum. Mm-hmm. And they had uh, the, one of the curators there was walking Wanda Sykes, one of the hosts, through the, the building and showing her different exhibits. And, you know, she was making jokes because she's the host. And obviously they want to promote that. Because, you know, oh, history film, come to our museum. It's like, okay. But the yeah. bottom thing, no, they just, like I just said, they showed the same montage your mom saw, and that was it. Hmm. Sounds like But I just well. thought it was weird, because for the other, the other film, all the other film tributes they did that night for anniversaries, they had yeah. actors or people from the actual movies there presenting it, but not James Bond. And it's like, you got Javier Bardem sitting right up there in the front row. He could have been up there presenting. He was one of the Bond villains. You had Rami Malek in there. He could have come up and present like, so that was just kind of odd that they got, you know, Sean White, Kelly Slater, and Tony Hawk to do it. And I'm like, uh, okay. I mean, they had the, you know, they had the bit with uh, Woody Harrelson and Wesley Snipes and uh, Rosie Perez when they came out to do their clip for White Men Can't Jump. I was they watching had, that part. That was the best right, part. Right. And they had, you know, uh, Uma Thurman, John Travolta, and Sam Jackson come out for the Pulp Fiction tribute. So, I didn't see so I don't get, So I don't get why. And then, you know, the Godfather thing. For some reason, Robert De Niro was up there, even though he wasn't in the original film. But they had, you know, Coppola and Pacino there. So I, I don't really understand the full logic why they didn't reach out and have the actual available Bond actors in the audience to come up and, hey, well, I mean, Bond movie actors, I should say, if you couldn't get the actual Bond actors themselves. And if I'm not, if I'm not wrong, I think Lazenby lives in Los Angeles, so they could have invited him. So. I, I, I don't know. It was just a little weird. That was a bit off-putting when they, they'd been setting a trend for all the other anniversary things for people associated with it to present it, except for that. I like and to other think than that all... very, And other than that very thin tangential relation that, oh, they're extreme sports people and Bond's an extreme guy. It, it just, so that, yeah, it was a little weird. I like to think that all of the Bond actors were there, all the surviving Bond actors were there, but they were just wasted. <laughs> They were like, you can't go on stage. You'll do something unruly. No. So, yeah, no, that's great. That's everything that happened at the Oscars. Yeah. Uh, so, the year was 1983. Kat, I know you watched these just before. I am at a disadvantage. I watched this week's movie, Never Say Never Again, last week. So... I hope that you'll help me, but I think I'm going to be more enthusiastic about this than you are. Yeah, so this film, uh, they had to, the first two choices for directors turned them down. Hang on a second. You're just going full tilt boogie headlong into disaster. (laughs) What are you doing? The movie is Never Say Never Again. It was in 1983. There was a battle of the Bonds. We have Kevin McClory. I was was getting to that. You start with that. I, we don't need to start with that. Everybody knows the story. No one uh, knows yes, the story. That's why they're tuning in. <laughs> Everybody knows the story. We've been talking no, about Kat, it. All our we're previous... the only. We no, have but... been talking about it in our previous episodes. They know about they it. They haven't now. seen any of those episodes. Yes, they have. So here we go. It was a t- he. Well, he had the rights still after producing Thunderball. Cubby and Harry thought that he would sell it back to them after ten years. He didn't, and that's why they were going to have. Uh, Blofeld be the villain and the spy who loved me and had to change it in the last second because they didn't have the rights, which is why Stromberg barely has any presence in that film. Mm. And so then he went ahead with this remake and Connery agreed to come back because they were going to pay him a boatload of money. And uh, he says, you know, I'm never going to do this again. And the wife says, never say never. And so she got a credit in the end credits for contributing mm-hmm. the title of the film, Never Say Never Again. Mm-hmm. I uh, saw that. It was very nice. They first went to Richard Donner Sean Connery personally took the script to Richard Donner. He read it, and he didn't like it and turned it down. So then they okay. took it to Peter Hunt, of course, who, who directed Majesties, and he turned it down because of his association with Eon. Do you, he didn't want Richard, to do you think that Richard Donner turned it down because he didn't like it, or, or he was like, so pretty much Thunderball? No, I think he turned it down because he didn't like it. He knew it was a Thunderball remake because... Connery would have told him that that was already the context going into it. And the script isn't that remarkable anyway. So yeah, he turns it down for that. Oh, okay. 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 Especially coming off like, Superman and, you know, uh, and Superman two and stuff. He's already, <laughs> yeah, he's not going to do that. So they then took it to Peter hunt. You know, he had done majesties and he's like, I'm not going to uh, do another, I'm, an, I'm not going to do a non Eon bond movie. 
So I was like, okay. So that, so then they found Irvin Kershner, who was willing to do it. Of course, directed The Empire Strikes Back. And RoboCop 2. Okay, and Eyes of Laura Mars and other things, but Empire Strikes Back. Uh, he said yes. I love Connery it. started training with Steven Seagal, of all people, to get into shape for the movie. And Seagal accidentally broke Connery's wrist during training, but Connery didn't realize that it was broken for over 10 years, <laughs> uh, which is kind of funny. And so, you know, they, they cast the film out. And it's like, okay, so this movie, they obviously had to make some changes because they couldn't, they didn't want to, they couldn't copy everything verbatim. Like you don't have the tip, the, the, your typical cue or money, it, it, that kind of stuff. So it be, or a gun barrel or any of that. Instead, it starts with several, it, it's like an overlay of the double of just zero, zero seven, like pl plastered all over the screen. Oh and yeah. You can see through it as the camera's flying over like this swamp or whatever in the jungle. And they're playing the song and the opening credits simultaneously. Yes. Which basically is Bond trying to infiltrate this compound in the jungle. And, you know, you have some very 80s type fight scenes and you know, whatever. And there's it's, like a moment it's, where. It's song, cold open, and opening credits all at the same time. Yeah. Now, I liked the song. I thought the song was fine. Uh, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. It's, and, it's but, better than all time high. Right. So, no, I didn't mind that one either. I thought that was a better song. But uh, anyway, right. this comp he's breaking into this compound and the song ends just as he detonates some bombs that he set. Anyway, he shoots up some guys. He goes into this room and finds this girl tied to a bed and he gets ambushed from behind by this thug. He throws him down on the ground. He goes over to cut her loose. And no sooner than he does, she pulls a knife and stabs him. And he's like really shocked and surprised. And it cuts back to M's office. And we find out that that was a training exercise they're like, oh, you failed Bond, of course. The kidnapped daughter of a millionaire, been with him for eight weeks. Of course, he's been brainwashed. <laughs> you idiot. Should have done better recon. Which I thought was actually, had it been delivered by better actors, had the delivery been better, it would have been funny. But it was just like a weird thing. It's like, okay. Uh, and so they send Bond, you're going to Shrublands, and make sure you kill, like you said, kill all those free radicals. Edward <laughs> Fox is an amazing actor. Yeah. But the, the 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 delivery of the way he said it was just kind of was like eh, okay I thought it could have been fired. But, but I, I, I imagine you know, Bernard I... Lee saying that line and how funny that would have been to see because you know the banter that Lee and Connery had in their films and what that would be like for him to criticize them that way I thought it would have been so much funnier. Um, yes, it would have been better because you respected Bernard Lee's M as more of a sort of stalwart military man, as opposed to being a, like, imagine, imagine Judy Dench's M as a woman. And that is, M, or as a man, Judy Dench's M as a man in is who is M in never say never again. Yeah. That is my personal interpretation of that because he's all like, you're eating too much red meat, 007. You're smoking too many cigarettes. And it's very, very... Yeah, so as a result, he sends Bond to Shrublands. Where we're doing the same thing again. He's got to get into shape, and he's seducing the nurses. And they did a neat twist this time. Instead of having the guy who's undercover there for Spectre um, be getting a full-on plastic surgery to replace the pilot to be in the plane to steal the bombs, instead mm. he's getting his, this eye surgery and a retinal... Uh, change in, in his retinas so he can duplicate the eyes of the president of the United States so he can use the retinal scanner to get into to access these nuclear bombs to make sure that their dummy warheads are replaced with live ones for a training exercise and hacked into Makes it so he can change to me so he can change the direction of where the bombs are going to go and they could safely land in the water apparently no 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 not at all uh, he changes it so that he changes the live warheads from the dummy warheads, but that's the only thing he does. Uh, the flying saucer and what's the name, guy? Claria Mouse Kaczynski? Largo. That's the one. So Largo... Uh, so Largo already knows how to control the, the missiles. It's just reloading them so that they have a, a nuclear payload. Right, but they have to actually launch the missile to get them out there. They have to steal the missiles. No, but the, the, the military is going to launch the missiles anyway. 
Right, but they still have to make sure they can intercept them before them without the military getting them. Yeah, but they already have the way to access the. They can uh, they can change the navigational. They I know, but get, what I mean in terms of navigation, like when you're using dummy warheads for like an exercise, they usually yeah. get you know destroyed or whatever. It's not really a thing, but they had to actually make sure that doesn't actually happen because they want to obviously keep the warheads, which is why they have to change not only where they're going to make sure they land safely. Mm -hmm. So anyway. A bond catches on to this scheme, and instead of Fiona Volpe, we have this woman, uh, Fatima Blush. It's like, yeah, okay, Fatima Blush. Very, very weird. And uh, she decides she's gonna instead of killing weird. Bond herself, she's, she's weird. a she's a vamp. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that part. So right. she calls in a henchman to deal with Bond, played by Pat Roach, who of course played the heavy, the big. You know, the big thug villains in all three Indiana Jones films. Uh, and so he's there as Lippy this time. Goes into the exercise room where Bond's lifting weights and tries to kill him. And they get into a rather long fight, or at least it felt long and drawn out to me. It even features them you know, punching at each other through the hallway while all the other residents are watching uh, boxing on TV. And silly things like that. And Bond eventually gets the upper hand and, and kills him. I kind of forgave it at the point of, because you know how much I love, uh, oh man, who's the guy in the glass shop in Vienna in Moonraker? Chang. Chang. I love Chang. And this reminded me of a Chang fight. Yeah, I kind of, I can see that. Yeah. So, like, yeah, that, that goes on a while. Uh, so then, uh, you know, Bond goes to seduce the nurses again. It's great. And he leaves and F uh, Fatima Flatbush after no longer needing this guy who's used as, who of course, as we know, is Domino's brother. She actually threatens him and beats him up at one point or slaps Wait, him around the side of the room. No, you're forgetting some stuff. You're forgetting some stuff here. Okay, so at the end of the fight with, uh, you know, the guy who played the giant Nazi who gets eaten by a, a propeller in Indiana Jones, this is and the guy that- gets killed by the rock crusher in Indiana Jones. And... Oh, in the second one too? Is it the same guy? Yep, same okay. guy. And he so, also was I mean, in the third one and had a fight scene that got deleted. He was the the Zeppelin captain. You well, see him when Bond, when you see him when Jones looks out the window and sees them running in to presumably go arrest him. Well, and but the thing is, is that this is the same guy. Yeah, and he gets eventually pushed into a uh, a rack of glassware that punctures his back but the way that he is thrown into that uh, rack of glassware is because he has something thrown into his face an obvious acidic fluid and uh it comes from a beaker and when james bond throws it into his face he ah, looks at the beaker and it says the urine sample of james bond 007 it is absolutely yeah, you have all that cheeky crap inside the clinic as well, you know. But it's absolutely slapstick. There is a certain level of comedy going on here. Like it is There is. That's why I said the Fatima Flatbush character or whatever her name is is Flatbush. Just, whatever the fuck her name is, I can't even remember. No, that would have been a better name. Fatima <laughs> would have a better name, especially Blush. considering her name what happens Blush. later in the film. Uh so yeah. anyway, she So she leaves with the other guy, kills him. Blows him up like we saw in the film. Uh, it, just like in Thunderball. They just follows the guy on the road, rock on, blows the car into like a brick wall. And then she goes over there slowly, kind of blows it up. And he's dead or whatever. Uh, M is furious that Bond is, you've just, I sent you there to destroy. What, what the hell have you been doing? And he says, uh, well, you know, I'm just taking care of free radicals, sir. And he's like, God damn it, Bond. That's just the precise reason me to disband. And, and it's kind of odd how, M is sort of like anti double O section in this movie. It's actually the British government, which insists on reactivating it to M chagrin, which is a little odd and out of character for M, but okay. Uh, and this is when NATO, of course, we get the big, or well, we have the specter scene, of course, where we have Max von Sydow with his Persian cat. Well, Max, uh, Bad, he's playing Blofeld. Yeah. He's playing Blofeld and he's announcing to specter, you know, everything they're doing and, the, the operation is called the Tears of Allah, which, uh, okay, and they're, he's talking about they're going to steal these nukes and they're going to make money off of it. And he, he talks to Largo, who's going to be the, the, the guy running the operation. It's like, cool. 
He the sends tears in his... of an Allah be- ends up being an archaeological dig off of the coast of someplace. Never mind. We'll get there. Ethiopia. We'll get there. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, um, the, the, the inspector notifies NATO that they're the ones responsible for the bombs. They want blah, blah, blah. And there's a big argument at NATO over who's responsible for this. this is ridiculous. And that's where we see a, a well, not a return, because this was actually two years before he appeared in that film. Uh, Bob Connolly, the, uh, yeah, yeah, he played Bob Connolly, the uh, construction foreman in View to a Kill. Nope, I guy missed that. In the mu- you, you didn't remember him? You didn't recognize him? No, n- no. Uh, you know what? There are times that you are smarter than me and you notice things more than me, but no, that is one thing that just slipped through my fingers. Yeah, so he's there, and he, he, you know, they're all talking tough, all this shit we can do. So M has to reluctantly task Bond with investigating this. And much like in Thunderball, the investigation takes him down to Nassau, yes. where he's supposed to meet a contact, Nicole. And he's meeting her at the dock. Things are going well. And all of a sudden, this guy, played by Rowan Atkinson, Mr. Bean of all people, runs up shouting, Mr. Bond, Mr. Bond, from across the plaza. Oh, he's what's his name? His name is like Smallfoot. Uh... No, it's faucet. It's uh, something no. faucet. Is it faucet? Okay. Yeah, small faucet. Something small faucet. Sm- no, small faucet sounds right. Yeah, so he apologizes for being late. And he's like, but I was trying to be incognito and not spoil my cover. And Bond's like, and that's why you shouted my name all the way across the plaza. So you're right. They're trying to do humor here. Yeah. And he's certainly acting like Johnny English, which I guess mm. is appropriate because he does go on to play Johnny English. Yeah. Oh, no, uh, no, no, no. Johnny English is cooler than this guy. Yeah, that's true. So, the, up to a, to a point. So, needs yeah. the coal. They got to do whatever you know they're going to do, and uh, goes. He has to find Domino because of the, you know they found out that uh, the guy had, that was the brother, you know, the guy that Spectre used was her brother, and that she was staying here. So he goes uh, to try and meet her in the casino. He poses as a or not even the casino. He goes to like the day spa or something. And he pretends to be a massage therapist to get information from her to find out where she's staying and where Largo is having. You know, she tells him a bit about what her brother was doing or who her brother was with, which kind of puts Largo on Bond's radar. Did we already kill her brother? Uh, yeah, he's killed on the motorcycle when uh, he left Shrublands. He was in a car. Well, that's what I mean. The, the Whatever her name was, I think was on a motorcycle and he crashes the car. No, I can't. I don't were- know. Okay, so here's what happened between Fatima Blush and the brother. So anyway, he does. Yeah, she killed the him. Thing. I explained that already. Okay. She killed him when he after they used him. He left. You really hate him. this movie. You won't even let me enjoy it. But <laughs> you didn't enjoy it. I no, but you know what? I kind of did. Oh, okay. I, no, but there's. But you don't remember a lot of what you watched. You said you were at a disadvantage because you haven't watched it. No, I was week. at a disadvantage because I had seen it a week ago. And so in terms of details, I'm having difficulty. Like, But I am remembering things about it. You just saw it fresh. Moving on. Let's continue. We so, can edit. We'll editorialize at the end. Vaughn's hanging out with Nicole, and they decide whose room are we going to go back to. So they decide to go back to his room. And while they're there, he gets a phone call from a uh, small faucet who says that Oh, fortune is favored as Bond. I found out where Largo's yacht, the Flying Saucer, is going to be heading out to south of France. And, uh, from the south of France, and we can go there. We can go scuba diving tomorrow. It'd be great. And Bond's like, oh, yeah, sure. Great. We'll do that. And he puts the phone in like the ice bucket. And then all of a sudden, there's an explosion from her room, Nicole's room, across the way, which Fatima has just destroyed. And, he's, and you know, small, uh, small faucet's like, oh, my God, what was that, Bond? And he looks out the window, and Bond sees this, and he tells Nicole, ah, oh, you were right. And she's like, what? It was the the right call. I'm in my room instead of yours, and so it's like okay, so you so you're alive. Uh, so taking up from Don's advice, they go to the cas- the big casino where he meets Largo, and they go play this interesting game. Uh, we're not playing whatever they were playing last time, Pinochle or whatever whatever it was. Uh, in last the time, Pinochle is that what you called it? I can't remember what they were playing in the no, first movie. No, but that's hilarious. That's great. Last time, Pinochle. No, I meant last not. time is in the last time they made the movie. So the they go into this room and they're playing this gum called it Intimidation or whatever. So they're sitting down and or maybe they were playing Bunko. I can't remember. So they're sitting down and it's like a game where 
you actually get like shocked, electrically shocked when you uh, oh, miss questions or whatever. Cat, cat. The what? name of the game is world domination. There are two yeah. joysticks. You have one joystick. You are attempting to take out the strategic locations within each country. Each country is worth a dollar amount. Largo is going to be playing for this dollar amount for his favorite charity, which is orphans, by the way. Anyway, you sit down and you play. You can control lasers to take specific locations. However, there is an option to send a nuclear weapon, but you can deflect that nuclear weapon with the other joystick, one, and then you can put up a shield. Now, if the shield works, you're good. But if the nuclear weapon gets in, it's not good. Oh, and by the way, every time you lose along the way during this video game, you get an electric shock. So if your points go down, you get an electric shock. The more you lose, the longer the electric shock lasts and the more intense. By the way, if you let go of the handles, like the joysticks, you forfeit the game. Those are the rules of this crazy batshit arcade game. And I can't remember the outcome of who beats who or whatever, but Bond eventually wins. True story. And uh, Largo's going to cut him a check, and Bond's like, no, that won't be necessary. I just want to dance the domino. He's like, okay. So he lets him do that, and you know, Largo goes up to the second floor with Fatima's there. And he's like, you know, he's kind of upset that she didn't kill Nicole the first time. And he says, well, do it again. And you can tell she's really giddy to be getting a second chance. Like, oh, I won't fail you this time or whatever. So Bond and, and Domino are dancing. They're having a time. And very strangely, Bond decides to tell her while they're on the dance floor that, oh, by the way, your, your brother dead. is dead. Largo killed him. And this is actually all a con and everything like that. She's like, ah, it's like. Did you expect her to? I mean, yes, she made no, her composure, I but did expected you... him to? Die. No, sorry, no. But they do a tango. It's a very awkward scene. Apparently, it was one of the most awkward scenes that Kim Basinger has ever filmed. How so? She said that she didn't really know how to dance. She didn't feel comfortable with the crowd and everything. The director was a little bit like she is portrayed rather like she's sexualized in this film. And yeah, and. The lighting in the scene is also pretty bad because it's so obvious that there's giant stage lights right off screen because the light yeah. doesn't look natural like it's coming from the room at all. And, but then Largo eventually takes issue with what's going on. So he kind of walks in and claps. His, he, he interrupts the dance by grabbing her and, and then he waves up his hands and the music stops. And he says, oh, thank you, Mr. Bond, blah, blah. And he kind of invites him to lunch the next day. And he's like, oh, OK, thank you. And Bond well, and leaves. also, I don't want to—I don't want to move on so quickly. But there is at this, like, there is a point where this does become sort of a Largo versus Bond fighting over a piece of meat, kind of. Like it, yep. it is of its time, and it is one of the. It is. It's. It does get troubling. Okay, so yeah, so uh, Bond goes back to his hotel, or wherever he's staying, the house or whatnot, finds the cold dead in the upstairs bathtub. And for some reason, Fatima thought it would be a good idea to take high heels to do this in, you know, on marble floors. So she's making a lot of noise on her way out. So Bond sees that she's leaving. He goes into the garage, steals a motorcycle, chases her down with this ridiculous chase where all the henchmen get involved. And she says on the radio, don't, he's mine. Yeah. It's like, okay. So he veers into a tunnel where they have a truck waiting with the ramp down and they try and herd Bond into the truck, which they do. And she's happy because she caught them, but they're so ridiculously slow at trying to close the truck. The Bond just drives right back out, revving over the cars and taking off. And eventually he finds himself down by the docks. Uh, especially to the small dock house where he's cornered by Fatima. And she seriously is like pushing the idea that she had to be Bond's like best romantic conquest or something like that. Because I guess they slept together at some point in the film. And but that's she's like, something no, that happens in Thunderball as well. Right, but the way she does it here just feels so so much more, you know, cheesy and so much more like she's literally off her rocker and sane as opposed to you know, the way Fiona Volpe did it. Because Fiona yeah. Volpe was being distracting and seductive about it, where she, Fatima seems to be genuinely perverted because she wants Bond to actually write a note saying that, you know, she was the best or something like that. I'm like, are you, are you for real? Is this what this movie is doing? 
No, it's but like he doing brought his... it up. He was the one who brought it up, and that's why I found it, it, it's not like she was like write a note. He said, like she was like, get down, spread your legs, tell me that uh, Fatima Volpe or whatever, what the hell, Fatima, what is her name? Blush. I can't remember. It's Fatima Blush. I. Uh, was the best that you ever had the most the, the the pleasure of your life and he was like well i was gonna put it in my like he does have typical bond quip and yeah. he says i was gonna put it in my memoirs and she was like really then fucking write it down and he pulls out his pen that he got from q but she still seems to be like genuinely excited at this prospect it's not like You've seen Xenia on a top. I don't know why crazy bitches ain't in your Bond lexicon. It, it is, but the way this one just seems to kind of come out of left field. It just uh, the whole. I'll, I'll get to it when I talk about at the end of the movie. So anyway, no, but they went deep sea diving, and there's an entire sex scene where you see her literally orgasming. Yes, and so Bond kills her by using this pen to fire a, a dart at her, and it takes a while for the fuse to go off, and she blows up, and he's like. Man, it, she blows it really up. wasn't ready. Yeah, he's like, wow, it really wasn't ready for, you know, uh, development or whatever. Oh, and I forgot to mention, they met Felix in this movie, too, when he first pick, picked up with Nicole. And Felix had this very weird introduction where Nicole and Bond had stepped out of the airport or whatever, and all of a sudden he just throws something at him, and the girl ducks because she thinks it's a bomb or something, like a grenade. And he's like, catch! And he's like, oh, your, your, your reflexes are still good, and it's like, okay, I get that Bernie Casey was an NFL player, but... It, is that really why we're doing this chuck the ball catch thing? It's just very weird. <laughs> it's like, Bernie Casey you know. was on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. All right. Uh, and he was Captain Cisco, or pardon me, at the time, uh, Commander Cisco's hmm? Ben, his best friend, Calvin. Mm -hmm. I love Bernie Casey. Whenever I see him, he is one of my favorite. Hey. Yeah. And I put first and also in legacy. Only legacy what? First, only African American Felix Leiter. Not the only. First? Yes. You know that, Scott. Who's the only who's the other Felix Leiter who's African American? Jeffrey Wright. He's not African American. I thought he was. He was. I thought he was of, of a different ethnicity. Moving on. Uh, yeah, that's Felix probably shows a good up idea. To save, Jesus, Felix shows up to save Bond because the cops have shown up at this location. Yes. Uh, they pretend to be jogging and bicycling out, and they they let him go. Uh, so then Bond decides to go with Felix, and they're going to sneak around the flying saucer uh, yacht. Bond gets picked up in the water. He pretends to have just been out for a swim. And he's like, oh, I'm so early. I'm embarrassed. So oh, don't worry. We'll get you some clothes, Bond. Osargo tells him, oh, it's fine. So Bond gets some clothes. And he sees that Domino's on board. She wants to talk to him. And he's like, okay. So they go into like this ballroom. They start talking. There's a two-way mirror. And Bond's aware that there's a two-way mirror there. And he tells her that I I need to I, I need to tell you. So just I'm going to kiss you. And I need you to act like you really enjoy it. And she's like, well, what's the second thing you want? From oh, because I've always wanted to kiss you from the moment I met you. She's like, okay. So they do Dang. that. And sure enough, Largo lets that get the better of him. And he immediately bursts to the room to find that they've already left and scurried out this side entrance. And she uh, pulls the fire alarm on the boat. And, and then Largo spins around. And it seems like he suspects correctly that Bond has gone back into the little recording room from the where the two-way mirror is. And he yeah. runs in that direction as if he's going to go in there. But apparently he doesn't. Um, so that's a little interesting. Uh, Donald well, doesn't really, he, yeah, doesn't no, I don't know where it, I don't know where that. Oh my god, it gets worse, guys. It does get worse later, right? Because now Largo decides that because he's so upset, he, well, he's gonna keep he's still gonna try to keep up the sake of appearances or whatever. And so when the boat makes it to his destination, Palmyra, which in the movie is supposed to be in North Africa, in reality, it's Fort Carre in southeast France. Really cool looking place, but they don't take advantage of it with the cinematography to show it off. It no, but looks even, like a, 
Well, What's I mean, the... if you've seen the actual photos of the place all restored and everything, it looks beautiful. Yeah. Here it looks like some rundown castle fort in the ancient place in the middle of nowhere. It, it's yeah, but weird. it works. But it works for the movie in terms of location set, uh, scouting and production. Like, I didn't really have much of it. Like. It didn't look like it was on a set. It wasn't on a back lot. And so I appreciated the location shooting. Right. So they go in and uh, Largo's like, okay, enough of the uh, pleasantries. It's over Bond. And so they take Bond into this side dungeon and As they tie do. him up. They, they manacle him up on the wall. And Bond asks, well, he says, you're going to kill me. Anyway. Where's the first nuke? And Largo's like, haha, you're never you're always still thinking of escape. He's like, well, the first one is under Washington, D.C., under the president of the United States feet. How they did this, I don't know. Uh, and so Bond asks, and this, and Bond stupidly interrupts him because Largo was still talking. Probably would have told him where the second one was, but instead, because he interrupts, Largo stops himself. He's like, "Ah, I'm not going to tell you." And he leaves him there to die. Yes, uh, John Domino, Connery had more lines. Terrible. Domino, meanwhile, he gives her this like jade statue and then smacks it out of her hand, and he leaves her to. He basically oh wait wait wait. Her Hang on, hang on, hang what? on. You are walking right over a scene that just defines the craziness of the possession, <laughs> which is established earlier on when Largo gives Tears of Allah the necklace, which ends right. up being like, that's the first part. And it's like, what happens if I lose it? And he says, I'll cut your neck or I'll slit your throat. Cut your neck. What am I? French? I don't know. And so then when they meet in the, uh, the, uh, welcome to your new home, essentially in this castle where she will die is that he's going to kill her. And he comes up and he says, this is a Jade statue, the most precious thing that I own in the entire world. And it was going to be our wedding gift. And he gives it to her. And then he's like, be careful. And then he does that sort of like thing where you're going to make someone drop something. And then she drops it and he laughs at her and he says, well, looks like I'm going to have to kill you or something along those lines. I think it's a great intimidation scene. It's something that is Domino is trapped. No matter what happens, she is trapped. And I find it, you know, it's a frightening scene. Uh, yeah, and it shows us how weird uh, Largo is yeah, um, and I like that his personality is a bit different from the his counterpart in Thunderball and this is why I thought Klaus Maria did a good job in this role even though I really don't like Kim Basinger's Domino because she doesn't even feel like the same character at all she no. seems a lot more heads she seems a lot more heads potentially headstrong even though she's not think clear as much as she could she's not as I guess young or I don't know I don't know if Ditsy would be the right word for it or sheltered or whatever as the domino from Thunderball, it just doesn't feel like anywhere in the range of the same type of character to have her basically play the same role in the story. Yeah, it's no, and weird. I I agree with that assessment just because I think that Claudette, sorry, we got to get, we'll editorialize at the end. Oh, were you going to say something? I was going to say that I think that Claudette Ojor was a much more innocent, uh, kept <laughs> woman. And yeah. Like she, she never in, indicated that she was in love with Largo. She appreciated, she was there for her reasons and she was willing to be ignorant of others. But when right. shit hit fan, there was a harpoon involved. Right. So we then get to an extremely dated scene, which is just bizarre, where Largo basically sells Domino oh. to this schwabby guy. A lot puts her on this, of like, dated scenes in this movie, but on is this, this the one? Solo. Are you talking about like the 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 virgin auction? Yeah. Oh my god. Exactly. So that happens, and then a bunch of yeah, other guys come no, in and start No, auctioning. but let me let me let me explain because <laughs> it does lead into the next action. It leads into the next action scene. So a bunch of guys that he opens up a uh, like a medieval gate ish. And a bunch of guys on horses in that region of the world. Where are we again? We're supposed to be in like North Africa. So we're in North Africa. 
So then they bring out this blonde woman. They tie her to a post. And everyone starts bidding on her. And then, yeah. luckily, Largo leaves. James Bond has a laser watch. I think one of the second. Yeah. And so he goes down, rescues her. But, on horseback. You know, on <laughs> horseback, in disguise. As, as the auctioneers are tearing her clothes off and throwing money around. Oh my they, god. They ride off on horseback throughout the castle complex they're be, or, and they're being pursued by the other guys and they oh no, they do, is... there's a really bad shot where realizing that they seem to be cornered, she thinks they're done for and he decides to just ride right off the cliff with his horse and you see the shot of them falling and it's clear they replaced the horse with like a plastic or like some type of dummy and then they, they fall into the water and that's all of a sudden when uh, this missile gets fired or whatever, just blasting at the walls of the castle as the you know, the Arab government were about to shoot at them. And we see that Felix is there because he's still been affiliated with Bond at this point and brought a submarine and they're attacking. Yeah. And they rescued uh, Bond and Domino from the water as, uh, the, you know, the, the submarine starts firing and destroying the fort, presumably killing the, the weirdos. <laughs> well, uh, and so, but then a horse chase ensues, right? Well, I just explained it. There was a horse chase throughout the castle and then they did eventually you, get cornered. Did you explain when he jumps off of the cliff on That's a That's literally what I just said. He jumps off the cliff and they use the shot where they swapped it to look like a plastic toy horse falling rather than throwing a real one off the cliff. I but oh wow, like but I thought it was a real horse. They jump off what they tricking you to think is an actual gar gargantuan cliff of the horse, but they didn't I, I didn't think they threw the actual horse over that. They weren't doing that stuff by 1983. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. That's why I'm you can clearly see, in sort of stutter you, stop. You, here. you can clearly see in the shot from the ground as they're looking up as they're falling down that that's not a real horse. I thought it's it was still, a real horse. It's still as a statue just falling like a plastic toy or something. Like and I, then, got my, I got I I rented my copy on YouTube in standard definition. Maybe there's a difference, but you know, I thought it was a real horse. Maybe for the last part where they hit the water, where they're not falling from that high anymore, but well, not from the worst the fall off the cliff. So, well, no, I don't think that Sean Connery I fell off that the twice cliff. Now, so. I know. If Moving on. He gets picked up by the submarine, and they're trying to figure out where Largo is. Uh, he gets notified by M that the bomb in Washington, D.C. has been found and defused uh, because he told Felix about it. And uh, M is really happy that he's pleading for Bond. He's like, you got five hours to, you know, find the next bomb or whatever. And so he goes to the submarine captain looking at a map. They can't figure out what it is. They know that the thing is called Tears of Allah. They're trying to figure out what, what that means. And Bond suddenly remembers that that's the name of her pendant. And he says, give me your pendant. And he puts it on the, the map and it lines up perfectly with this geologic feature. And, it, and he says, oh, well, where the diamond in this necklace is must be where the bomb is. And, so, and they identify that as being off the coast of Ethiopia. And again, you can't get from the coast of North Africa to the coast of Ethiopia, I don't think, in five hours' time. Uh, or less than that, because they have to go there. And they do kind of a convoluted thing, where first Bond and Felix take these new versions of jetpacks, where you're standing up, and instead of wearing it on your back, you're kind of standing inside the apparatus as they're flying over this uh, village, and they see the well, because they figure they have to go down the well. So Bond goes in to infiltrate first to see what's going on. Like you said, it's an archaeological dig site, the interior of which was built at Elstree Studios. Yeah, oh, and, it looks great. Yeah, and you have all of Largo's guys there in their scuba gear, and they're getting ready to go underwater to get the bombs. So Bond stealthily sneaks around. He gets back outside to go notify Felix of what's going on. They start, you know, assembling the frogmen, as it were, to go in to, to intercept this. And then Bond goes back inside with the jetpack, returning to the well goes inside to infiltrate and he disguises himself kind of like a thunderball in one of the uh, scuba suits. Yeah. You then have the underwater battle ensue. The frogmen show up. It doesn't go on as long as the underwater fight in thunderball. Uh, and yep. in this instance, bond is deactivating the bomb from the, with the, the boat that the sub boat that uh, Largo and his guys loaded it on like the little, the one that would carry it to the surface. And mm -hmm. he's like opening up the he, he's like opening the, the control panel and he's tapping it to deactivate it. And as he's doing this, Largo, who Bond had pinned to the wall between the 
the little subcatch boat and the wall of the ca underwater cavern, picks up a spear gun, and he aims, and he's about to shoot Bond in the head with it, and then at the right second, Domino comes in and shoots Largo in the chest from the yeah. front this time instead of the back. And this Bond is all underwater. It's fucking dope. So Bond, sees, so Bond sees that. He's kind of impressed. And then it kind of gradually does this crossfade to her swimming in a tiger suit, a uh, bathing suit, in a, a swimming pool. sexualization in this movie, yep. Yeah, and it felt so anticlimactic that when you compare it to the climax of the original movie, especially. But the, climax, just kind of, the climax of the original Thunderball, it does just end as well. Well, no, because you you have the awesome speedboat chase, and it's like heightened tension and excitement. This was just kind of you have the a shorter version of the underwater battle, and it just felt kind of there wasn't didn't seem to be as much tension or anything when he gets shot, and for it to suddenly do a crossfade that fast without a big crescendo ending, like like the, the climax of Thunderball ends with the Disco Volante blowing up and shattering windows thirty miles away. True, this just kind of it, it's like he's shot. And it's like oh, and then it just crossfades and it's over. Uh. So he's she's swimming in the pool. She gets out of the water, walks over to the hot tub where Bond is, and brings him two drinks. He's like, "But I usually have a martini at five. And she's like, "Oh, well, things change, but not for you, right?" And he's like, "Oh, now they do. I'm retired. I'm done." And then all of a sudden, the camera cuts to somebody. We don't see who it is, only that they're coming through the gate. They're making noise. Bond gets worried. He gets out of the pool to see who Johnny it is. He hides behind the bush, and then he jumps out and grabs a small faucet and throws him into the water of the pool and. He's like, so I'm just, I'm just here because M wants you to come back, and we, we need you. He feels that the stability of this seven. says we feel the stability of the civilized world can't last without you. And Bond is like, sorry, never. And he embraces Domino, and that's the end of the movie. So problems. One, we talked about the problem with Domino. She's not Domino. Uh, Hang on problem. one second. What? I, I, I apologize. This is the part of the show. Now we finish the thing. I got to go pee. I got to go pee. All right. I'm just going to keep talking. So the Good problem is that Bond is not Bond in this movie. He's totally phoning it in. Kind of like he did in You Only Live Twice. He's kind of bored. He's just kind of there. He's way over the hill. Uh, the idea that these younger women and stuff are fawning over him is it doesn't really track. Uh, the I, I don't think the Fatima character works as well as Fiona Volpe or Xenia on a top. The story lot, it feels like a much lazier version of remaking Thunderball in terms of which story points they choose. And the, the, the bits into legit comedy. I and mean, yeah, the Bond films have humor, but this is like, you know, Mr. Bean territory, like silly stuff. And with the whole, the virgin auction and, <laughs> you know, the stuff, um, some of the stuff is trouble. Is this getting to the point where it's like, are they, were they trying to do a little bit of a parody here? I'm not sure. But I love that they have uh, Claus Maria Bandauer as Largo. I thought he was really good. And I like some of the changes in locations. So you're not just going to the same place. Like, even though they went to Nassau, it doesn't really look like the same as Nassau or the Bahamas from Thunderball. Um, even though Thunderball's locations were better, but I still don't like the trouble and stuff. Yeah, it feels like they spend less time there, which is a good thing. But that whole, it just feels like a mismatch movie. Like, it's same with Thunderball. You don't do the whole 40-minute trouble and crap. And the, the extended thing, crashing the jet in that movie to start the film. And you don't do the trouble and thing here, but they do it anyway in both instances. So, it just felt kind of, yeah, it's lazy. It's a lot of dated stuff in it, very 80s. The lighting at times felt like it was soap opera. Same with the directing. Like the whole Fatima Blush character. Yeah, it's trying to do Xenia, but it feels like the soap opera version of Xenia. So, yeah, it just wasn't really my cup of tea. I mean, I, I probably haven't seen this movie in 20 years. I'd seen it probably a couple times. but So I could say that the song and the, the villain were good, and that's, that's about it. So... Um... You've been you've been talking for a little while, and for yeah. that, I severely thank you. Um, what would you give it out of? How many martinis so that I can respond with my assessment of this film? Uh, like a two. Wow. I think I liked it more as a little kid. Watching it now is I'm not gonna lie; it was a really hard movie to get through. Okay. 
I was surprised. I didn't think I would find it that bad. I remembered liking it, and this time I just really didn't. It was just, I mean, after You Only Live Twice, which I thought was really boring, I think this is more boring than The Irreverence of Diamonds. I would prefer The Irreverence and Silliness of Diamonds Are Forever to this. Oh, but the thing is, is that Sean Connery looks so much better in this movie than he did in Diamonds Are Forever, which is against the laws of it. time. I agree. That's the weird part about it. But it again, really is everything I just said, the soap opera nature of it, the lazy plotting, the the all the, right, the, all that is just no. I, I'm sorry. And I like and Irvin Kershner as a director, but not here. No, no, no. I'm not asking for you to apologize, Kat. Part of the reason that I enjoy your company is because we disagree. Um, you gave Octopussy a four. Yeah, it was a better movie in the Battle of the Bonds. And then, by the way, it did win financially, did much better than this film. But I looked it up. This movie actually has a 70% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, if that means anything, which I thought was considerably high. Yeah, uh, that's higher than I would have thought. Yeah, no, I didn't expect yeah. that. Um, I gave Octopussy a two. Oh, and there's one thing I forgot to mention. I do appreciate the fact that Felix actually gets to join in on the action during the climax rather than just... In the, in the official series, he's kind of there to consult and maybe provide some assistance, but he doesn't usually get in on the action. So I like that yeah. he did that here. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. like, And he's more like, eh. well, there's a kind of a cute joke that happens. I don't know if we mentioned it, where uh, when Bond and, and uh, Felix are getting away and they're pretending to be a boxer and and his trainer. Yeah. It's kind of it's kind of cute. I noticed that Sean Connery was uh, riding a bike in barefoot, which I thought was not something that yeah. I would do. Uh, so anyway, I gave Octopussy a two. You gave Octopussy a four. I am certainly giving Never Say Never Again higher than Octopussy. Oh, wow. Now, yeah. Oh, certainly. <laughs> um, heck, where are you, uh, Die Another Day? Oh, I gave Die Another Day higher than Octopussy. I don't like Octopussy. <laughs> if I have found anything... I can't remember. What did you... I can't remember. What did you give Octopussy? A two? Two. I just said okay, that. Where did you, at, you gave Die Another Day a three? Four. A four. Okay, so what do you give this? We have to take one more movie into account, my friend. Do we? We do. <laughs> I gave what? Thunderball a seven. And so did you. Yeah. So if I have a choice of what I am giving, I would say that this movie is better than Die Another Day. I'm giving Never Say Never Again a five. Oh, wow. Yeah. I am's what I am's. Yep. Um, now, the fun thing is, is that this is, a James Bond movie. So I don't have to really compare and contrast against other movies, but you're giving this a, a two, you say? Well, yeah, like I said, uh, he just doesn't feel like James Bond to me. He's just phoned it in again. And it's like, he seems unbelievably bored in this. It's not as believable that he's the guy he's trying to be the idea that well, women, so all this kind of stuff, I'm just not buying it for what they're trying to, who the character is. Just, I'm not buying any of it. I am I am feeling Sean Connery having fun acting in the same way. Heard, but I said the whole thing has kind of a soap opera type effect for me. It's like, no. There is a bit of a early 80s soap opera effect to me, of course. Yes. Um yeah. it's almost like a a weird shambling of trying to convolute the story together, but it gels more for me than Octopussy and it isn't as silly as Die Another Day. Yeah. But it's not, you know, I can't give it better than Thunderball. Like, that would be rude. Yeah. Anyway, let's go. Do you want to see what the chat is saying? Uh, Sure. Yeah, let's do that. Well, I don't know. You know what? I've never had this before. So maybe you can help. <sighs> we have a member. There's a member at the Phantasmagorium now. Oh, I believe I saw that. I know, Matt. Yes. Lacey. Hey, Matt. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know why you uh, have so much money. <laughs> Anywho. Because he's looking. Right hey, Kim, up. Kim. 
right up off the hop cam cams crash course hey Catherine and scotty hello to you cam cam thank you for being here i appreciate the fact that you think that this show is bullshit and uh really meryl streep is gonna be lady macbeth i guess so you know it'd be interesting to find out who macduff is I, I I wish I knew what he was saying bullshit in response to. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Uh, I don't know. Probably keep something. going. Keep going. Cobbled together, but Connery is Bond. Hey, yeah, he was once. <laughs> I can't disagree with that assessment. And. You know what? When you do mention it, it does become a bit of a parody of Bond. But it's still coloring within the lines enough for me to enjoy. Stockholm Syndrome in reference to the uh, the young lady with the knife. Yeah. Captain <laughs> Marty Spock. Ahoy. The name's Scott. Or the name's Ford. Scott Ford. I don't know what that means, but I'm sure it is automotive. I think instead of Tom Ford, you're Scott Ford, the fat suit. It's a, I stole it off a homeless person, as usual. Uh, Patty Hearst uh, fight. Anyway, I'm going to editorialize a little here. Pat Roach played the big officer. Yes, he was the, the lippy guy at the Shrublands. We talked about this. He was the, you know, he was in Indiana Jones as uh, the guy at the plane, the Nazi officer at the plane who goes to the propeller. He's the slave driver who gets hit in the rock crusher and Temple of Doom. And he was the Zeppelin captain whose fight got cut from Last Crusade. Our newest member, Matt, says, oh, my God, I need to rewatch this. Yes, you do. It is only five dollars on Amazon Prime. We are not sponsored by Amazon Prime. Uh, it's available on YouTube as well. I think that's where I got it because it was cheaper. Uh, and yeah, so you do have to. Uh, I assume can't... he's talking about the movie and not about the show that we're doing right now. <laughs> I hope yeah. he's talking about the movie. Yeah. We're free. We don't have, you know, you can subscribe. Well, like, he, he, he didn't say anything about having to spend he money. He already paid for the he show, didn't say, Kat. He, he, didn't say, he didn't say anything about having to spend money to rewatch this. He just said, oh, my God, I need to rewatch this. Oh, it's That's true. What... He may have a VCR. We don't know. Uh, what? It's true. No, I mean, he may. Just because he said, I need to rewatch this. You said our show's free. Well, he didn't specify whether he would have to spend any money to watch this again. Well, no, but the thing is, is that because he's a member, he's already spent money. Oh, Jesus. Okay, keep going. Tears of Allah, uh, you know, I'm sure that that is the proper pronunciation. And then uh, God's will. See, and this is what I think that we were discussing in regards to Domino Cam Cam, is that she was an ingenue. Yeah. And that's there. And there's a certain level of innocence towards that, which is, you know, endearing. And I think that Claudette Auger uh, did that better Claudine. than Claudine. My mistake. Uh, did that better than Kim Basinger. I think that she did contribute to the more um, soap opera. Yeah. Uh, Tiki Fire gives us a hell. Hey. Uh, it's so dark in that set. Of course it is. Of course, yes. Captain Marty Spock. Cat, if you want to read. Yeah. Good, a good climax is an essential component of any movie. 100% agree. Tiki Fire says, Cat? Says the movie's a guilty pleasure for him, but it's so bad that I still watch it when it's uh, when it's on or if I'm in the mood for something weird yet bondish. It's nice to go off the beaten trail from time to time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan of Thunderbolt, though. Thunderball. No, I know he corrects himself later, but I like oh, this good. one better. <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan of Thunderbolt. <laughs> you just you already showed that one. No, I know. I had to go back to I just prefer it when he calls it Thunderbolt. Cam Cam gives it 
four martinis. Well, you said you made it sound like there was something else that he had to see. You're like, wait, I like this one better, and I thought you were going to show another thing that he posted, but I guess not. No, he said he said I'm not the biggest fan of Thunderbolt, and then he corrects himself to say Thunderball, and then right. he gives it. There a, it is, five point six five nine martinis for me. Okay, point six five nine. That's it's weirdly specific, but I. Get... <laughs> that's more than my martinis. We'll we'll yeah. call that we'll call that uh, olive buoyancy. Yeah. But 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 but, but. Rowan, Rowan Atkinson. Yeah, like Scott, <laughs> Scott said, it's leaning into parody a bit. Tiki Fire goes on to say, part of the soap opera effect for me is the terrible theme song. Ah, uh, I still it think does it's, feel a bit eighties. I could buy that being seen as a soap opera song, but I kind of liked it. I still think it's better than All Time High. Gundle Whittle Bomb, my favorite Whittle Bomb. One of my fave bonds. It's so fun. And Sean clearly is giving it his all. And I think so. I think this is the most spirit that you see in Connery since like the early bonds. He well, they hadn't done I don't I don't <laughs> think there's much spirit in this. I do. I, I, I thought it was just a really dull performance. I was like, okay though. I saw more in this than I did in Diamonds Are Forever. And what did I give Diamonds Are Forever? I don't know. We don't have time. We'll find out because that will be the subject of our next thing. So let's. Keep... You know, that's a good segue, Kat. What are we doing next week? Nothing because I'm not going to be here next week. But um, what are we doing on our that, next show? We will be uh, going over all of our ratings or, again that we get, all the martinis that we gave for these films. We will yeah. tabulate the complete total of how many martinis we each consumed throughout all 20, uh, 28 different Bond properties. And uh, we'll reevaluate and decide if we need to change that. Yeah. And so um, are we going to be able to uh, sort of shift and, and switch on the night? Are we going to be able to say, well, maybe I gave that too high. Maybe I gave yeah, that well, too yeah, low. Well, that's, that's the whole idea. Yeah. Okay. So cool. So next time, after having watched this being our 31st, 30th episode of Martinis, Gadgets, and Guns, next week we will, or next time, we will be uh, putting in our final tabulation as well-educated people who have gone through all of the uh, cinematic James Bonds. Yep. All right. Well, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, a little bit of trivia. I found out that when Kevin McClory tried to do this a third time, he wanted Timothy Dalton to play Bond for Warhead 2000. Huh. Yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> oh, my God. We should watch The Rocketeer. Anyway, that is <laughs> enough from us this evening. Thank you so well, much. We that, that is also our last bond recap review for quite a long time <laughs> but and you know what i was thinking about this before we started the show the best part is never 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 say never okay. say never 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 say never again never is that it we're done should i cut it never